the reactions. And, uh, uh, we described the relation between them and chemical reactions uh, uh, to that mass and energy equivalent to each other. We learn how to calculate the Q value of a reaction, which is the energy release in a reaction. Not only did we do that, but we also uh, figured out uh, by conserving momentum, in conserving energy, and uh, conserving the charge, uh, and conserving the number of nucleons, uh, that uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, calculate how much the energy release or the Q value apportions itself in between the products of the reaction. And uh, what goes against intuition uh, was uh, proven. It turns out that, uh, in that case, say the neutron in a DT reaction, or uh, the gamma photon, in fact, would be the lighter particle in uh, N gamma reaction, where a neutron is absorbed by the nucleus and a gamma photon is emitted. The light according to conservation of momentum carries most of the energy from the reaction. Uh, we backtrack now and we can get uh, a better uh, insight into nuclear reactions in general by plotting the masses of the uh, in nature and that also have been uh, invented uh, by humans uh, uh, either in uh, uh, nuclear reactions, uh, particle accelerators uh, uh, or uh, nuclear uh, fission. Uh, 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 research reactors or in uh, nuclear uh, explosives. And uh, to write an estimate for the binding energy, the tremendous amount of energy uh, that binds the nuclei together that we can release either by fission or fusion, we take the mass of the protons that compose a nucleus multiplied by the number of protons, which is the atomic number, mass of the neutrons multiplied by their uh, number and subtract from it the actual measured mass of the uh, nuclear in that case that this is the difference between the component uh, and the actual mass that's measured is obviously the mass that binds all those nuclei together. So an expression for the binding energy is uh, written here D M P plus N M sub N minus the mass of the atom uh, in general. You notice that uh, you can add the masses of the electrons for the first term here. And, uh, uh, and in that case, uh, you'll find the neutron, of course, doesn't have electrons around it, but uh, the masses of the electrons cancel out. And we are entitled uh, to use really the neutral masses of the uh, atoms to carry on that calculation. What's uh, of more interest than the binding energy is uh, in binding energy per uh, nuclear. And uh, the binding energy per nuclear takes that E sub B here and divided it into capital A, uh, the total number of nucleons. And then we can generate a graph of the binding energy per nuclear for all the natural, naturally occurring uh, isotopes. And uh, again, it's telling us our internet connection is unstable. Lucky we can proceed, but I uh, find that the curve starts at a very small number isotopes of deuterium, for instance. Deuterium has a very low binding energy per nucleon, hence, you can really uh, separate the deuteron from the neutron in deuterium without being radioactive. And then you'll find the binding energy per nucleon. Uh, Please. Professor? Yes. Maybe switching off your video would help. Uh, oh, oh, okay, I'll stop sharing here uh, the media. It says you are muted, press alternate, so the, the microphone is working and the video is working here. Oh no, sir, maybe internet, since internet is slow, maybe if you uh, turn off your video and just share your uh, audio and screen, then uh, uh, there won't be much more fluctuations. Yeah, I'll share the video and the screen, definitely. Here it is, share the screen. Share, I'm sharing both of them. All right, so uh, again, it's not 
under our control, so I'll have to pursue. If again, the internet plays a trick on us, the actual notes there, notes are available. So the binding energy per nuclear reaches the maximum uh, in the peak part of the period where we have the iron and the nickel. And uh, we know that the center of the earth is uh, composed of iron and nickel. And then you'll find that the, uh, the average there is around 8.5 uh, million electron volt energy per uh, nuclear. Then you find that the binding energy per nuclear decreases, 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 and then there is an empty area, and then we find another area where basically looks like an island. Uh, uh, the people who work in that field call it an island of stability, where you find the heavy elements, the uranium-235, uranium-238, thorium-232, and so on. You notice uh, in the same way that we have a stable configuration in the atomic structure uh, of the electrons, you'll find that here we have some local minima, one local maximum actually here, a local maximum uh, shown uh, right here. However, uh, you'll find that uh, to reach that region of high stability, we can do one of two things, either get one of the elements, the uh, low energy per nuclear region and split it. If you split it, you turn it into two elements there in the middle of the periodic table elements, which are more stable. And this process is what we call fission. However, we can also bring in two of the nuclides or isotopes in the low en binding energy per nuclear region, like deuterium and tritium, and uh, fuse them together and produce an element, uh, uh, helium in that case, that has a higher binding energy per nuclear. And the difference, according to our equation here, is going a different a difference in mass uh, that would be either the fission or the fusion energy being released. So we can uh, release the hypernuclear either by fission moving from right to left or from, uh, or from fusion moving to right. Uh, in the appendix, you can find the, the masses of the known isotopes uh, in uh, and we can take that data and try to, uh, to plot it. Uh, in that case, we define another important quantity that we call the mass defect, which is the difference between the actual mass of the atom minus the mass number or uh, the mass of the, uh, uh, the components, uh, uh, neutrons and the proton. And uh, the same way for the binding energy for nuclear, we take that mass defect divided it by the total number of nucleons, and we call this the packing fraction. And from our own data, we can come up with that lot. The packing fraction here has a function of the mass number immediately that uh, it's the inverse of the graph uh, that I've shown you a minute ago. You'll find that initially the mass is very large for the small uh, elements, but if the heat deuterium, then it reaches a minimum, and we have two local minima here, and then it increases back again, and then we reach that island of stability. In that case, we have four elements in our database. That would be the three isotopes of uranium, uh, uranium-235, uranium-234, uranium-238, as well as uranium-232. But uh, if you take uh, the elements that are known to us uh, in you find that humans have created uh, many radioactive isotopes than uh, the ones that exist, the elements that, or the isotope that exist in nature. So you could see uh, these uh, uh, dots here, each one of them represents one of the known isotopes produced by humans. If you fully at the graph, you find that these uh, shapes take a, the shape of a parabola. And that parabola is, describes the process of radioactivity, where nature loves stability. So all those radioactive isotopes that are be, uh, way uh, from, uh, that are out of the stability or the stable isotopes in nature uh, undergo radi radioactive decay to try to reach uh, that stable configuration. So nature loves stability, and uh, uh, the, it's no. Uh, a secret that the center of our Earth is a combination of iron and nickel. Uh, these are two elements that are extremely stable, uh, very difficult uh, in that case to uh, fuse or to uh, fission. But 
Fiesta. Study right here, these are isotopes that can fission very easily because uh, binding energy per nucleon, the same as the deuterons and the trite. Uh, if you, uh, you already probably accessed the chart of the nuclides, and uh, you notice if we plot the number of protons or in the existing uh, natural isotopes, you can generate that uh, data yourself uh, from the, uh, our uh, chart of the nuclides in the appendix. You'll find that initially, uh, if we plot the number of protons against the number of neutrons, is z equal to n, so it's just a, a line five degrees. But if you follow that line, it would move along the arrow here. Uh, actually, when we get to the heavier uh, isotopes, you'll find that they start more neutrons than uh, protons. So there is a deviation on the z against n uh, graph uh, in the direction of more neutrons. And again, here, this is our famous the three isotopes uh, of uranium occurring in nature and the sodium uh, 273. In essence, we have 279 stable isotopes. Uh, they can be divided into four categories depending on the even or odd uh, that describes those isotopes. So if, uh, if the, the N, the no neutron number, the Z, the proton number, or the atomic number, or the mass number, if that even, 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 that is a larger number of existing isotopes in uh, nature. And we have only 279 isotopes existing in nature, but uh, you can count uh, that humans have created uh, in nuclear uh, research reactors, in particle accelerators, and in uh, nuclear explosions. You'll find that uh, even, even, even isotopes are the most stable uh, isotopes, but you find some of them that are uh, uh, odd n, uh, even z, and odd a, and 50 of them that are even n, odd z, and uh, uh, odd uh, a. Only four of them are odd n and odd z, and uh, even though the mass number is uh, even. And uh, in that case, if you take, for instance, uh, uh, yeah, uranium-235, uh, it would be one of those isotopes that are very unstable. Uh, as I suggested, uh, uh, we, uh, we have created as humans more radioactive isotopes than exists in nature. You find that those little squares here on the Z against N curve are the natural isotopes but, uh, above that line have an excess number of protons and uh, uh, because they're on the side of uh, the Z uh, axis and some isotopes that have an excess number of neutrons uh, because they are on the side of the N axis. Again, nature loves stability. So you'll find that those isotopes that have an excess number of neutrons try to reach the stability line. And they do that internally by one of the neutrons turning into a proton, which moves them to uh, the left and in that case, an electron has to be emitted because we can look at or a neutron as a particle, composite particle composed of a proton and an electron. So isotopes on that side of the ability to emit uh, negative electrons. So this is what happens in our universe. But when they have an excess number of protons, uh, they emit a uh, positron or the antimatter of the electron in our uh, universe. Or they can also decrease the num excess number of protons by grabbing an uh, inner electron from the electronic shell. And uh, in that case, they reduce the Z number and move towards the stability uh, line right here. And that process is called the electron capture process. So isotopes that have an excess number of uh, 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 have an excess number of neutrons tend to be beta emitter, in that case, negative electrons, and those that have an excess number of protons tend to be neutron uh, emitters uh, for each person in general. Uh, we have looked uh, already at that material uh, last time, so I'm going to uh, the calculation of the Q values. Uh, notice that uh, uh, in the calculations that we carried out, say, for the DT reaction, for instance, the D plus T, giving us a neutron plus an alpha particle. These are called uh, uh, binary reactions. And 
correct numbers on the left hand side uh, on the right hand side so we can go to the chart of the nuclide that gives us not the masses of the nuclei remember the reactions are between the nuclei but they give us the masses of the neutral atoms so it includes the masses of the electrons so we can simply assume that the electrons are going to cancel, which they do data from the chart of the nuclides. However, in some reactions that uh, uh, were, uh, that are not binary reactions, obviously, you'll find that the, uh, we have to take into account not just the mass of the electron, but the binding mass of the electron. So let's take, a, for example, uh, the carbon uh, 12, uh, carbon 11 uh, isotope. Notice here, it has six protons and 11 minus six and five neutrons. So it has an excess number of protons. You can to reach stability, would try to emit a, a positive uh, 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 electron, which we call the positron. In fact, it is the antimatter of the negative electron. And a neutrino is emitted in that case. Uh, uh, when we get a negative uh, electron emitted, well, by definition, we call it anti-neutrino, which is a uh, antimatter of the neutrino. But in that case, a neutrino uh, is emitted, and we find that our carbon-11 turns into uh, five boron-11, an isotope of uh, uh, boron. Uh, if you uh, if you ignore the mass of the neutrino because it's very small, you that you have to subtract from the atoms one electron mass to calculate the Q value. And there are exceptions like this uh, in the rest of the periodic table. Now, this is a reaction also where, uh, in that case, uh, copper 64 has an excess number of protons. Uh, so uh, in that case, instead of emitting a positron, it grabs an uh, inner shell electron. And that is called the orbit orbital electron capture. And a nickel 64 isotope and a neutrino are emitted. In that case, uh, we can use the neutral masses, but take into account the difference in the binding energy of the electron to calculate the in the uh, uh, shell electron. For instance, for palladium 103. So we have to really uh, think about the different reactions here. Uh, the simplest reactions uh, uh, are the ones that involve, for instance, the emission of negative electron. If you take tritium, an isotope of hydrogen, you'll find that it has one proton, but three minus one, two neutrons. So it's neutron rich. It has too many neutrons. And to get it self-balanced, it gets rid of one of the neutrons, turns it internally uh, into negative electron and a proton, approaches the as helium-3, and an anti-neutrino. You see the star here designate. By definition, they called it anti-neutrino, they could have called it neutrino, but uh, by definition, uh, the reaction uh, is associated with an anti-neutrino and basically a negative electron is emitted. So tritium emits anti-neutrino. Uh, you would be using uh, tritium here, whether you're using a phone or a, uh, uh, or a, <clears throat> a screen of a computer because tritium is used in a very, very, very tiny quantity uh, in the LCD liquid crystal displays in general to activate the colors of the phosphors that give us the different colors, for instance. In that case, uh, you find that the masses of the electrons cancel out. Uh, if you are taking the mass of the tritium minus the mass of the helium, uh, hope you get mi minus uh, one electron mass, then you get the energy release from the decay of the tritium isotope. Uh, some reactions uh, uh, involve uh, the plutonium, uh, the alpha particle emission. Uh, it's a different part. We know better today. We alpha particle is a helium for nucleus. So plutonium two thirty nine that we produce uh, in our thin reactors from uranium two thirty eight <coughs> to the breeding process uh, eventually uh, turns into. Uranium-235, uh, that very few people know, uh, by the emission of an alpha uh, particle uh, in general. Uh, 
But again, we studied last time that by conservation of momentum, calculate how the energy partitions itself with among the different uh, elements. We also looked at the fission process. We can calculate the Q value of the reaction uh, by taking the masses of the reactants minus uh, the masses of the uh, product. And uh, uh, we conclude uh, from that calculation that uh, a fission process produces maybe about 200 million electron volts of energy, which is uh, 10 times the energy from a fusion uh, reaction. Uh, as fission occurs, uh, we end up with two uh, fission products in the middle of the periodic table. And uh, the distribution of the uh, uh, masses uh, uh, in the periodic table of the element depends on the mass number. You could see here that the double curve, uh, one of high atomic number and one would have a lower atomic number. And you find that the higher the energy of the neutrons, uh, from the DG action has 14.06 million electron volt. Uh, this is not very significant, but you turn on neutrons, definitely you could see a very large difference between the products of uh, fission process uh, itself. Fission, so the fission process, let's remember it, produces about 200 million electron volts of energy. You subtract the energy carried by the antineutrinos because <clears throat> the fission products produce lots of uh, uh, beta particle emissions. So you can say 190 million electron volts per uh, fission. Uh, uh, some elements like uh, plutonium 239 em uh, emit, uh, uh, not just emit, but they can spontaneously fission. And that's why, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you use the implosion process uh, moving at the speed of sound to uh, uh, create a critical configuration using plutonium uh, 239. The neutrons uh, born in, uh, from the fission process uh, have an average energy of uh, 2 million electron volt. And this is the energy distribution of the fission neutrons from uranium 235. Uh, compare that 2 million electron volt shown here. Look here. There are uh, the maximum or uh, most probable energy from uh, fission uh, to uh, 2 million electron volts to the neutron energy from the fusion reaction, uh, the 14.06 reaction from the fusion uh, reaction. And the emission of a neutron is average uh, with the emission of 2.47 neutrons per fission. And uh, it is a little confusing because uh, we are using the new symbol here. Uh, the symbol here in that case is a number of neutrons. So a neutron, but it's really an average. Sometimes it's two. it averages up to 2.47. We'll use that in calculations of critical masses by the end of the semester. The distribution uh, takes the shape of a hyperbolic sine curve multiplied into uh, the energy. So that is that curve here. It's called the Watts curve uh, by the name of the gentleman who uh, basically developed it. Wonderful. Now, when uh, uh, fission occurs, we get uh, fission products. And uh, those fission products are unstable. So over time, they start emitting neutrons by themselves. So let's take two examples of them. Uh, the uh, uh, iodine-137 isotope. Uh, is a fission product. Uh, it has what we are going to call later 23 second half life. And the bromine 87 is another isotope which has a longer half life, 55.6 seconds. Now, as those uh, isotopes uh, are emitted from fission, they remain radioactive. And look what happens here. They emit a, a beta particle uh, with a certain probability of a nucleus of krypton 86. And then uh, neutron emissions. We call those neutrons that are released from the fission product, uh, uh, the delayed neutrons. And that delay in the neutrons makes the control of nuclear reactors possible. So our electrical engineers use that property to make the system sluggish, to reduce its time constant. Otherwise, uh, nuclear reactions would be occurring 
uh, with the prompt neutrons or the neutrons coming in from the fission process at a rate in the microseconds, whereas here, uh, this is a rate in the seconds. And that's what allows us to uh, control nuclear reactors. Those delayed neutrons play uh, a crucial role in the control of nuclear uh, power plants. As radioactivity occurs, so you can look at uh, a model of the fission process as a neutron combining with the nucleus, say of uranium-235, plutonium-239, and uh, that energy turns the nucleus into an unstable hydrodynamic configuration. So you'll find that the nucleus wiggles up and down or left and right like a liquid drop. Eventually, the charge on that side and the charge on that side split the nucleus and the two to three neutrons are uh, emitted. So we call this a liquid drop model uh, for the fission uh, uh, process. And uh, uh, there is more detail about it if you are interested in uh, the nuclear physics uh, process itself. Again, uh, this is the configuration of the four stable odd, odd number nuclei. Uh, these four nuclei that are just uniquely stable are deuterium, uh, three lithium-6, five boron, and and nitrogen protein. Uh, so deuterium is uh, uh, that uh, it's very unstable. It has only 1.1 uh, million electron volt per nuclear per nucleon uh, binding energy, whereas other flights have an 8.5 million electron volt per uh, in, uh, energy general. So if you have those nuclei, they show that uh, par parabola shape. <clears throat> that I mentioned to you uh, earlier uh, in the unstable uh, radioactive nuclei. So here we are coupling really process of uh, uh, binding energy in the nuclei, nuclei to the process of radioactive from uh, each other. As I suggested, uh, uh, the nuclei uh, uh, in nature and the artificial nucleides have uh, shells in the nucleus in the same way that we have shells of electrons uh, in the atom. And uh, <clears throat> those shells uh, have uh, uh, configurations uh, at 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126 uh, no atomic number or mass number A. <clears throat> I put this into a graph shown here. And uh, you could see that uh, at uh, 20 maybe, uh, you find those peaks here. And here, <clears throat> those shells configurations, 20, for instance, uh, would be for N or Z. That would be calcium 20, calcium 40, as an example. Uh, you could see that these are called the magic number. Uh, people just uh, like to call them magic numbers. So because they are closed shells, then so the nucleus behaves uh, as closed shells. Some nuclei are more stable than others. The atom has more configuration that are stable than others uh, in general. As I suggested, uh, we are dealing uh, in the periodic table of the elements with the series that we call the actinides. Uh, that series, uh, uh, you could split the periodic table of the elements here at that point and show a long line here and then reconnect the other part, but then it will take uh, a large space. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, the actinides that we are dealing with are the uranium, uh, thorium, neptunium, and plutonium. Uh, all these other uh, higher number uh, 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 actinides, uh, the americium, the curium, berkelinium, californium, einsteinium, fermium, mendelevium, uh, nobelium, laurentium, uh, are very, very, very short-lived. So they have been producing particle accelerators or nuclear explosions. Uh, the ones of practical or engineering practice is uranium, thorium uh, as a longer term because thorium uh, occurs in nature four times in, uh, in abundance than uranium. So it's a much uh, longer term possible isotope for producing fission for humanity. Uranium is associated with neptunium-237 and with plutonium-239. So these are the elements that we are going to concentrate on. As uh, this graph shows us the situation of the state of learning, as I mentioned earlier, that island of stability. Uh, and uh, this is the depiction by some people from the Lawrence Livermore lab. 
uh, they call it the map of the isotopes. So they talk here about the lead continent where we have the stable isotopes. Then we have some kind of an island uh, of stability, which contains solium, uh, uranium, and plutonium. And then we have what they call shoals. These are nuclei that are deformed, but they're not stable. So they show them as a shoal. A shoal is a, a rocky formation in the ocean that is covered with water. And some people speculate that maybe, just maybe, there is another island of stability here, uh, island of stability of the super heavy spherical nuclei that need to be discovered. Because they may have occurred at the time of the Big Bang, be still available in uh, in space in the remnants of starry flow of super uh, So you could see that uh, an area of exploration. Uh, 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 they designated as one of the only grails of physics to discover that new island uh, elements in that new island of stability, either uh, existing in nature or by uh, creating it by adding to the stable nuclei uh, or, uh, uh, solar uh, nuclei like uh, carbon uh, nuclei uh, in general. All right, in terms of the strong force that determines for us the contents of uh, our universe. And uh, the fascinating thing is that uh, uh, the, uh, what we know about uh, our universe is uh, what, the, what we call the luminous matters. These are what we see in the, in the sky at night, the stars, uh, luminous gas radiation. And uh, this is what we know about uh, our universe yet. Uh, if you think about uh, also non-luminous components, intergalactic gas, neutrinos, supermassive uh, black holes, uh, these are known. But look at this. Uh, this is only 3.6 plus 0.4 here. That's 4% of the mass of the universe. What is the rest of it? Uh, uh, we only know, as I suggest here, uh, 3.6 plus 0.4. That's uh, 4%. What is the rest of our universe? The rest of the universe is considered, uh, according to cosmologists, into dark matter, ma energy, and that composes 73% of the mass of the universe, and dark matter, 23% of the universe. So the knowledge that we have about mass is only 4%. So that uh, means that uh, we have to learn about these topics in, with humility and modesty. Our knowledge about our universe is only the 4% that we can see. Uh, we can speculate here in our class that when people talk about by the fact that there is uh, mass are interchangeable, that maybe electromagnetic radiation uh, is uh, basically uh, uh, radiation, the, that mass, that missing mass, uh, is possibly electromagnetic radiation that didn't exceed the threshold of two electron masses, 1.02 million electron volt, two masses of the electrons in general. And dark matter also is possibly electromagnetic radiation. Uh, people suggest other particles, subatomic particles, I call them the WIMPs. Uh, some people suggest it's a plasma turbulence in the cosmic current. But again, uh, we just and only clear all our libraries in all our uh, uh, books and uh, reports and uh, lectures, uh, all we know about our universe is 4%. So the discovery of the uh, extra 96% uh, is left for generation of scientists, uh, physicists, and engineers uh, in general. Uh, again, uh, the magnetic interactions in the universe cannot be ignored. Uh, even though some uh, these are shows us the magnetic formation, if you have uh, a rotating plasma, definitely it creates a crack in the center that is known electrical engineers. If you have uh, a magnetic field uh, uh, that moves uh, along a filament, along a, this line out of the page, you create a magnetic field around it. And vice versa, if you have a rotating magnetic field, you must be creating a current. So electromagnetic radiation is part of our universe, but uh, some people only uh, try to describe the universe using the uh, 
internal force, which is not true, only the gravitational force. And that's a hint for those of you who would discover new discoveries in uh, the future uh, in general. There are different theories of dark matter and dark energy. Uh, what we can only do uh, with our knowledge uh, is so far to deal with the 4% of the matter that we can see in our universe. Yet, uh, we know that dark matter exists by observations from a, a satellite, so the, the Hubble uh, telescope. And uh, uh, this is the Milky Way here. And uh, some people think that our Milky Way uh, uh, is surrounded by envelope of uh, dark matter. So we are sending uh, probes and uh, telescopes like the Chandra X-ray uh, telescope. It looks into the universe, not uh, through what we can see with our own eyes of the light part of the spectrum, but looking at the X-rays part of the spectrum, which are associated with this fantastic phenomenon. This is a uh, suggesting basically that the cluster there is surrounded uh, by the heart that's shown in red, and the blue uh, color would be uh, dark matter that we don't know what it is. I surmise uh, that it may be electromagnetic radiation that is ready to be turned into mass if its uh, 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 frequency already uh, exceeds the possibility of uh, turning into mass. Another Hubble state faced as a telescope image uh, showing here what is thought to be uh, dark matter in a galaxy uh, cluster. The source of this is NASA. Uh, you are invited to go and look at it uh, in more detail. And uh, that uh, ends up our chapter on the uh, uh, ends up our chapter on the strong force. And uh, from there, uh, I'll open up the chat room if you have any uh, question in general. Uh, hi, Professor, would you please be able to disable your video camera while retaining screen share? It is quite difficult to follow along with the action uh, uh, Francesco. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I can do that, uh, but uh, I'll try it for the rest of the lecture. It may be a good suggestion. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, Internet basically is unstable today, maybe it's weather related. Uh, I'll try that. But if you have any questions about the chat on the stone force, uh, uh, or uh, by the end of the lecture, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, uh, if there are no questions, uh, I will uh, disable, uh, let me if I can disable the camera as you, the gentleman, suggested. And was just sharing. So it is possible. Thank you. Very good suggestion here. Hope you connection. Uh, uh, as we suggested, uh, it's still there. <laughs> Your internet connection is unstable. Well, uh, we'll uh, keep proceeding. As I suggested, uh, we have a complete set of notes as our uh, plan B. Uh, in that case, we add uh, not just the uh, uh, the strong force, but we go to the weak force. And the weak force, uh, the second force of nature that we are interested in, uh, appears as uh, in the form uh, in our field, at least uh, uh, as the radioactive transformation. We started already mentioning radioactive transformation in the previous chapter because the uh, it is uh, closely associated uh, with the strong force. The strong force. Uh, re try to reach stability by radioactive transformations in general. And uh, radioactivity is part of life uh, uh, in our universe, on our Earth. Uh, I, uh, in the first paragraph, I do mention that, quote, at any given moment, thousands of rays of radiation are crisscrossing the human body. Some of them coming from concentration, coming from of the universe, and some of them are in our own body. And some of them are really from like carbon-14 in uh, the wood in our structures or uh, uh, radiation from radium and thorium in uh, building materials if we live in brick homes, for instance. It is important that uh, we all become literate about radiation. Uh, we have to survive radiation in primary. A little bit, it's how humans, uh, animals, and plants have evolved. 
but too much of it can hurt us. And I think we want to learn as much about it. How was uh, radiation uh, discovered? Uh, basically, it is uh, uh, the knowledge about it is built on the shoulders of great, uh, very smart people from Sir Isaac Newton, uh, Robert Boyle, and John Lockie. And uh, it became available uh, in 1919 uh, uh, in Manchester University in the UK uh, when uh, experiments carried out by a New Zealand uh, scientist, uh, uh, he also is also Nobel Prize winner, Ernest Rutherford, working with one of his students. And uh, uh, the observation was that they had a sealed container where they had some uh, ra radium. Radium is a decay product of the uranium chain. And as the radium uh, tries to reach stability uh, later on, like lead, I will see that in the, at the end of the chapter, uh, it emits uh, radiation. And what it emits as radiation is alpha particles. So the scientist, uh, Mr. Rutherford, is in a jar that contained radium 26, discovered that there was hydrogen being formed. Where did hydrogen come from? Uh, they used their uh, intellectual curiosity and they found an explanation for it. They knew that radium 226 emits an alpha particle, which they called at the time alpha particle, but now we know it's a helium nucleus. So that helium nucleus is emitted in the equation. If radon emits a helium nucleus, its atomic number is decreased by two, so that's 86. And 86 is a, uh, a, another isotope or another element, in fact, and that's what we call radon. Uh, radon, interestingly enough, uh, we'll study that later because it can affect your well being, each one of us. It can, uh, uh, the Surgeon General warns us about radon in construction materials or uh, uh, homes built on top of granite formations that would uh, emit the radon. I'll tell you about. Uh, it's health hazard uh, at the end of the chapter. Uh, radon at room temperature is, in fact, uh, has a high, bo uh, a low boiling point. So in that case, at room temperature, it's a gas. So let's say, call it here the radon gas. Uh, the radon 222 is now a product of the decay of radioactive transformation of. But we have here alpha, an alpha particle. And uh, the air we breathe, as you know, that was also in the jar that contains the radium, contains hydrogen. 50% of the air we breathe right now, you and I, uh, is hydrogen. And then a little 15% oxygen. So the alpha interacts with the isotope of H14 in the jar. Uh, basically, it turns it into oxygen and hydrogen. And that would be the, for the discovery of uh, uh, nuclear transformations or transmutations, which was a dream of ancient alchemists. If we add two equations, we'll do that a lot in our course. You'll find that uh, helium-4 and helium-4 here take part in the reaction, but they do not appear if you add the two equations. So helium-4 becomes what we call in chemistry a catalyst, right? So that's a catalysis reaction. Uh, if you cancel helium-4 and helium-4, you find that radium in the jar that Mr. Rutherford and his students were working with the presence of, of the uh, nitrogen-14 turns uh, into radon-222, oxygen-17, and the hydrogen is emitted. So that was the first description of a radioactive transformation, transmutation uh, process. Uh, nowadays, those transmutation processes, which were the dream of the Middle Ages uh, alchemists, are routine uh, happenings in nuclear uh, reactors and uh, particle accelerators, in uh, laboratories, uh, and uh, well, in nuclear devices uh, all, uh, also. It can happen in many, many, many different ways. We mentioned the beta decay negative electrons emitted for neutron rich nucleides. Uh, we mentioned uh, positron emission for positron-rich uh, nucleides. We mentioned alpha decay for some of the heavy elements like uranium and plutonium. And that's number two and number three. Is that uh, nuclides can emit radiation. 
they can also emit electromagnetic radiation uh, with a very high frequency, uh, similar to light, but uh, light has a very low frequency and hence low energy, uh, but gamma rays are emitted also in those nuclear reactions. We mentioned also orbital electron capture for uh, isotopes that are rich in protons, proton-rich isotopes. We mention also the delayed radiations, like the delayed neutrons from the fission products. But there are also uh, reactions uh, that we haven't covered, like uh, because they are rarer, uh, isomeric transitions, like a nucleus of uh, uh, can be uh, highly uh, uh, excited, and then it emits gamma radiation. Uh, from what we call isomeric state. So you can have isomers uh, or different uh, forms of an isotope that have uh, different levels of excitation. Internal conversion happens. Spontaneous fission was mentioned. It happened in plutonium-239. That's why they cannot get a better concept of a critical mass with plutonium-239. In that case, uh, they use the implosion process. Uh, some observations have been made of double beta decay uh, for some isotopes like molybdenum-92, molybdenum-90, and the whole of atoms being emitted decay. So you find some uh, heavy elements can uh, emit whole uh, nuclei of carbon-12, carbon-14, oxygen-20, neon-20, magnesium-28, or silicon-33. So it's very important for us to uh, study uh, the processes of radioactivity. Uh, we move from being qualitative into being quantitative. We ask ourselves a question. If I start a number of atoms that are radioactive, like uranium or thorium, uh, uh, how much is left after a certain time t? And uh, we're going to follow two approaches. One is uh, what we can call a heuristic approach using some simple rules of thumb and mathematical induction. The other one where we uh, follow uh, a calculus, uh, differential calculus approach and get a different form of the equation. But there are different forms of the same process, so we prove that the two approaches are equivalent to each other. So let us consider uh, some uh, a number of uh, uh, atoms of a radioactive substance, let's call it and sub zero. All right, now uh, let us uh, consider the time that it takes it to become one half the initial amount, which is N naught divided into two. And in that case, the elapsed time is what we are going to call the half life of the isotope. And we've described all the isotopes by their half life. I might send you as an exercise to the chart of the nuclides where you would uh, uh, the half lives of different isotopes. The range of years, like for tritium, it could be in the range of billions of years, like uranium, and that's why that uranium still exists all the way from the time of the supernova that created uh, the solid or the rocky planets, Earth, Venus, and Mars, for instance. Uh, after uh, two half-lives, it's very obvious that, that n naught over two it becomes n naught over four. Uh, the initial number of atoms are going to be half, half, half uh, life. And after half life of atoms would be uh, n sub zero, the initial number multiplied by one half to the power of n. So in that case, uh, from that very simple heuristic kind of thinking, we can deduce that the number of nuclei present after n half lives, n sub n here of n, number multiplied by one half to the power of uh, n. And uh, basically you'll find that uh, uh, this is an equation uh, in the variable uh, uh, as n, the number of half-lives. That's not very convenient. Let's see if we can turn that equation into an equation in time. Yes. Now the number of half-lives multiplied by the number, the length of the half-life multiplied by the number of half is obviously uh, to n t. So let's change of variables here where we replace n here uh, by t divided into uh, the half-life. t divided into one half immediately something uh, that n 
uh, a, a power of one half is t, the time elapsed divided by the half-life. And the half-life is available to us in the chart of the nucleus. So in that case, I can say that the function of the time t is the initial number of atoms. How do you get those? If you know the mass g, you apply Avogadro's law, g divided into the molecular weight gives you the number of moles or gram molecular weights multiplied into Avogadro's number. But here, uh, we are talking about the variable n, the number of atoms that are radioactive. And that is really a very simple way of deducing the law that governs radioactive decays, provided we know what is a half-life and we know how uh, to get this from the chart of the nucleides. Well, that is one form of the law, but uh, let us try uh, another approach that depends on differential calculus. Uh, in that case, we'll say that then if we are observing a radioactive substance, the number of nuclei that emit radiation within a given time t is a differential of the number d n of t, d n of y or dt. And the number we are going to observe in an interval of time dt to be proportional here, this is a symbol for proportionality, of the existing number as well as the uh, length of period of time dt that we are going to observe the process. Uh, wonderful. Uh, however, it's a decay process, so it's uh, something that is decreasing to a negative sign. Well, like this, uh, uh, we can get rid of the proportionality constant and replace it by an equal sign, a constant of proportionality. So let's do that. And we are going to use a proportionality constant, a lambda. And lambda is that, in that case, obviously, would be named the decay constant. So dn of t, the small differential in the number of atoms that have decayed or undergone radioactive decay within a period of time uh, is equal now, instead of the proportionality sign, minus lambda n of t dt. Okay, now I want to get a, an expression for n as a function of time. So let's separate the variables. We get the n of t on one side here, dn of t, and we bring that n of t on the right-hand side back under it, and uh, we meet, let the time be on its own on the right-hand side, and lambda is a constant. So this is basically a, a separation of variable process. Uh, to determine n of t, all you have to do is add an integral sign on this side and an integral sign on this side, and then we can get what is n of t. Now we are going to use uh, uh, integration uh, by parts, let's uh, talk uh, about it uh, uh, because being basically taught before to add constants of integration, which can be confusing. Let's learn how to do integration by the limits. Integration of the time is very obvious. It's from a time t equals zero to some any arbitrary time t prime or let s. This is basically a dummy variable as. And uh, corresponding to the time t equals zero, the initial number of atoms is n sub zero uh, to any uh, upper, uh, upper limit time n of t. Now we know from uh, uh, calculus that the integral of d sub x is the natural logarithm of x. The integral here of dn of t by n of t is n of t from the low limit n sub zero to the upper limit n sub t. And all, uh, the uh, lambda, the decay constant, the constant comes out of the integral as we've done already. Time integrated goes from time t equals zero to any time t. Okay, uh, let's uh, uh, substitute for the time t, t on the upper limit minus t at the lower limit gives me minus lambda t. And uh, the integral of dn by dn is the natural logarithm of n minus the natural logarithm of which is the same as the n of t divided into n node, and this is equal to minus lambda t. Well, we still don't have an expression for n of t. It doesn't look very nice. But in algebra, we know that if we take the exponential of log of x, we get x. OK, I repeat again. The exponential of the natural logarithm gives me the argument of the logarithm. So if we take the exponential of minus lambda t right here, and we take e to the log of n of t over n node, 
that exponential of the logarithm gives me n of t over n of expression for n of t number of atoms after the given time t is equal now to n naught e to the minus one t. Well, uh, this is a different equation than the one we have derived. Uh, we cannot have two different equations describing the same process in nature. Who is find a way of understanding the equivalence between the two. So let us think about that decay constant. What is that a decay constant? Uh, let us first define what is a half-life. The half-life is the time t at which n of t becomes n divided into two. So let us by the symbol for the half-life that we used before, t sub uh, one half, and uh, n of t after one half becomes n naught, and we know this quantity is one half the initial amount. So we can write that n naught over t is equal to n e to the minus one t half, and obviously n sub zero and n sub zero cancel, so we have one t is equal to e to the minus lambda half. Okay, we can get rid of the exponential uh, of the logarithm function uh, in any uh, algebraic expression by taking the exponential of it. We also can get rid of the exponential uh, in algebra by taking the natural logarithm of it. So let us uh, get rid of that exponential. It doesn't look nice here. So let's take the exponent, uh, the logarithm of e to the minus t to the one half. It becomes uh, basically minus uh, lambda t one half when we take the natural logarithm and not natural logarithm of one. Uh, minus the minus logarithm of two is the same as taking the natural logarithm of one half. Uh, if you go and graph the natural logarithm uh, graph, uh, the natural logarithm of one is zero. And we are left with the natural logarithm of two, uh, which we know from maybe different other courses is equal to 0 0.6931. And in that case, if this is zero, then I can uh, live in terms of the decay constant. The half-life is equal to the natural logarithm of two because that log one has disappeared. The negative sign has disappeared. Uh, T one half is equal to the natural logarithm of two divided into lambda. So let's go to the equation that we wrote earlier here and replace that lambda by the natural logarithm of two or six times one divided into uh, the half uh, and uh, in terms of the half-life as n of t is equal to n naught e to the minus the natural logarithm of two divided into the half-life. So this is an equation that we get from differential calculus. We got an equation earlier from just a heuristic approach. They cannot be different. Uh, they are equivalent to each other. So if you take n is equal to the, the number of half-lives is equal to the time elapsed divided by half-life substituted in the equation that we derived. So the number of atoms or nuclei at, after n half is equal to n sub zero e to the minus n log two. e to the minus n log two can be written as one because it's a negative exponential here, one over e n to the log two and uh, uh, e uh, divided by n to the log two is the same as uh, e to the power of or the logarithm of two to the n's power. And what is e to the log of n? It's n. So that's one over two n. Oh, look at this. We get back the same equation that we got as a uh, function of the number of half-lives from the heuristic approach. So either uh, method uh, or equation uh, describes the law of radioactive decay. It's a very simple law that tells me that uh, the number of I decay uh, and so halving process after each one half, you find that you have half the number of the nuclei or atoms that we started up uh, with. All right, uh, let's uh, just uh, put in some numbers, say after seven, half to the power of seven, uh, you'll have basically 100 uh, the amount of the radioactive isotope that was there. Notice this is a halving process, and the halving process. Uh, where the uh, whatever we have goes by one half, one half, one half, one half, uh, is it what's called the decay, exponential decay process. So the exponent 
uh, that we got in the equation is called exponential decay. Uh, when you are doubling the amount of material, then you'll find that the process increases exponentially. So it becomes a positive exponential. And for instance, if you want to have it uh, double uh, at a certain interest rate after, say, 10 years, that uh, describes how uh, it would grow uh, with uh, uh, at least the interest on uh, your money. So uh, you can have, or the, how the uh, power in a nuclear reactor increases by uh, the number of neutrons present if we say withdraw the control rods. When we withdraw the control rods, it's a negative exponential, the power goes down. When we withdraw, uh, uh, down, when we withdraw the control rods, the power doubles, then doubles and doubles, goes up exponentially. Uh, as a number of the half-lives, you'll find that uh, by plugging in the first equation, the mystic equation, you find that after seven half-lives, you left only with one hundred of nuclei. So this is a rule of thumb used by people who work with radioactivity, uh, environmental studies, or any kind of radioactivity. And after ten half-lives only, you find that you have only one thousand, because that's two to uh, uh, the tenth power. Uh, you'll find that this is 1,000 initial uh, amount. Uh, people like to use uh, uh, radioactive decay. Why? Because uh, it is tabulated. So let's go back to our uh, web page here and let us go uh, to the appendices because I'll send you to the internet and have you uh, get some uh, data. We go to the internal link, the data of the isotopes and elements. We go to uh, the chart of the nuclides, uh, maybe I like one. Uh, okay, so square and ten degrees nicely. Thank them for that. I hope you can access it now, but it's, it's unstable. What happens? Uh, okay, well, uh, it's in Korean here. Uh, Let's uh, try another one, the deep probe, maybe. It's not found. Uh, uh, own chart of the nuclides, maybe. Uh, we cannot find it. It seems that it's unstable, really unstable. Uh, today, let's IAEA. And here we go to uh, the chart of the nuclides. Let's take one of their isotopes. I haven't tried this before, but uh, we can uh, get uh, the chart of the nuclides from the International Atomic Energy Agency. We click on the isotope of interest. Opium 147, and it gives life. You could see here that's 24 uh, days, whereas Europium 147 has a half life of only 0.765 uh, microsecond. Mu here stands for mo. There are lots of uh, uh, that's where you can uh, get the, uh, the, the half life. Tested that. Uh, uh, you may find that the range of the half-lives ranges from what we have seen just a second ago uh, as uh, microseconds <clears throat> all the way to billions of years um, uh, isotopes. Uh, we go back to our uh, chapter on the, the uh, <clears throat> radioactive transformation theory. So we derived the law of radioactive decay in terms of the half -life. At some point, we prefer to use what's called the mean lifetime. So what's the mean lifetime is a process of averaging the length of the half time, half life, and that is basically taking the mean value. You take the time, uh, integrate it over the uh, distribution in that case, because it's a probabilistic or statistical process, and divide it by the total number of atoms uh, from zero to infinity. 
And uh, when you carry out that integration, it's an integration by part, uh, you discover that the mean life or the average life is equal to one over lambda, what we call decay. This average active decay can take an average form as n is equal to n naught e to the minus t over the mean lifetime. From this, we can deduce the behavior of any radioactive isotope. So I take, for instance, <clears throat> the isotope of tritium, uh, which is an isotope of hydrogen. It does not occur significantly in nature, maybe trace amounts, but of course, we pro it is produced uh, uh, for thermonuclear devices. And in our future, we want to be able to use it in future fusion. So that life of tritium, if you go out to the chart of the slide and get that life, is 4.33 years. So in that case, if you use a hand calculator or uh, you can go and write a computer program. Here is a computer program provided for you in the visual Fortran, Fortran compiler. You can plug in the half-life, T12.33 years, and you can show it over uh, different time steps. And that's what we get. Actually, we are uh, graphing here N of T divided into N naught. It doesn't matter really how many, uh, uh, how many grams of the isotopes we have. You could see when you take the ratio to the initial number of atoms, you this is how the exponential decay curve looks like. And if you want to check it, here is here. If you go up, 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 follow the arrow, you'll find that you have only one half of the number of the uh, isotopes. So in that case, you can determine uh, how the isotope behaves as a function of time. Uh, that's not what we do. Uh, we don't go into, say, one gram of tritium <coughs> and count. Instead, we use very sophisticated electronic equipment. And what we can really measure is the rate of emission of the radiation, which is in our equation not the n of t, but the dn by uh, dt. So if you take the dn by dt in the equation that we derive for radioactive decay, uh, d by dt, a constant, the n node comes out. And then you take d by dt of the exponential. It is equal to the exponential itself uh, multiplied into the d by dt of the argument, the exponential, which gives us the dn by dt is equal to the n of t. We have derived that equation in a previous uh, set form. Uh, previously. So this is a quantity that we can really measure. Uh, however, that quantity has a negative uh, sign. Uh, I'm going to measure a positive quantity. So we take the absolute value of n of t, and which is the rate of emission of the radiation, and we give it a new name. We call it the activity. So A of T is the modulus or the absolute value of the rate of emission of the radiation. You can calculate it by taking the logarithm of two divided into half-life multiplied into N of T. You can graph this uh, quantity uh, instead. So A of uh, to A lambda N naught e to minus uh, T and lambda N naught is what we can call activity at time t equals zero. If you want to express it in terms of the average half-life, then that lambda becomes really replaced by one over tau, uh, another way of describing the law of radioactive decay. Well, if we measure that radioactivity, <clears throat> we'll have a whole chapter on how radiation is measured. Uh, we need units for it. It's like when you measure a distance, you need a meter or a mile or a kilometer. Uh, we need a unit for that uh, activity, as we called it. And this is a first unit that we find in our core of energy, electron volt, erg, and quad, and uh, joule. Uh, it's now a unit for uh, activity. And uh, to our uh, person who first uh, discovered the radioactivity, we mentioned in the first chapter that it was Henri, Henri Becquerel, a French a French uh, scientist. We honor him by giving the unit uh, 
system or the system that uh, everybody tries to use, uh, we call it the backup. And uh, uh, it is abbreviated BQ <coughs> for backup. And it's basically one transformation per second. Earlier on, before SI system in the conventional uh, people uh, were honoring Marie and Pierre Curie, uh, and uh, they used the Curie as people like to pronounce it. Uh, one Curie was equal to 3.7 10 to the 10th power transformation per second or Becquerel. Uh, the choice there was basically uh, to uh, the activity of the page 226 that Marie and Pierre Curie worked on. And uh, so I'll give you a where you take one gram of the isotope radium 226. It, uh, the number from Avogadro, uh, the atoms uh, n sub zero from Avogadro's number, and multiply it by the decay constant, the natural logarithm of two divided into the half life, and you can get the equivalence of the Curie uh, as being uh, 3.7 10 to the 10th transformations per second. And then we know that the Curie is equal uh, to that number that it should be a small uh, multiply sign here. <clears throat> the uh, it is uh, very important for us as engineers, you know, if we are electrical engineers, we know, you know the units of the ohm and the uh, volt and the ampere, uh, or uh, thermal in, or chemical engineers, we should know the joule and the uh, erg. Uh, it's very important when we learn about nuclear uh, science that we know uh, the units that are used for measuring radiation. Uh, so here we are learning two new units, the Becquerel in the SI system of units and the Curie in the conventional system of units for measuring activity or transformations uh, per second. As I suggested, the Curie is the activity of one gram of the radium 226. In uh, uh, scientific applications like in chemistry or in uh, environmental engineering for the civil engineers. Uh, we uh, like uh, to use either a certain quantity uh, uh, a liquid or a, a volume or a mass and then estimate the activity or the number of uh, radiations occurring per, it per unit time. So in that case, we define what we call the specific activity. So when you say the word Specific, it's usually per unit mass. So if you take one Curie per gram, uh, this is uh, what we call the specific activity. If you take one Becquerel per gram, that's what you call the specific activity. Specific, like specific mass is basically another uh, uh, way of describing density. Or you take a certain volume of material and consider the uh, activity of it. So you take the Curie per liter, if you are dealing with a liquid like the radioactivity in the water in Clinton Lake from the operation of the nuclear power plant there, uh, or you want to measure the activity of the cooling at the core of the act itself, and you take the Becquerel per centimeter, that's the Becquerel centimeter cube. You obviously notice that uh, <clears throat> the Curie unit is uh, quite a large number of. Uh, radioactive transformations, whereas the Becquerel is a small number. So that happens within the centimeter cube, the gram. Uh, this Curie now happens with larger volumes and uh, larger masses. Uh, in general. All right, uh, I suggested uh, uh, we, we use a half life. Think how different isotopes uh, work. Uh, these are measured quantities. And uh, what we do is that we take a, a substance, uh, we take the uh, uh, we use uh, electronic instruments like we are. I'm going to show it when we cover the chapter on uh, <clears throat> uh, electromagnetic radiation or gamma ray interactions with matter. Uh, you take the function of time, you plot, and then take the, the uh, activity equation. So you end up with a curve that is really a straight line. And when you measure the straight line M here, uh, the, that would be equal to lambda, the decay constant. 
And the decay constant is a natural logarithm of two divided into the half-life. So you can get measurements of the radioactivity. And then you can infer it uh, for some short-lived isotopes, like in years, to the uh, uh, long-lived isotopes in billions uh, of years. How do we produce radionuclides? So I said this is uh, uh, using neutrons. So you place a material in a nuclear reactor, and that is the rate of formation of the isotope that are being absorbed in the material, uh, minus the decay itself of the material. So if you solve that equation, you end up with a curve that uh, looks like a sigmoid. It grows up, and I'll show you the curve without going through the detail. An example, though, is uh, uh, producing manganese 56 from manganese 55 by irradiating it. Okay, so manganese 56 decays into iron 56. So you can use a manganese 56 as a radioactive isotope, maybe to determine the volume of a blood. The patient because the manganese 56 becomes the uh, unharmful, totally unharmful uh, iron 15, uh, 56. Uh, through the emission uh, of uh, iron uh, of uh, uh, negative electrons. Uh, and uh, this is a stable form of the iron. So after five hours, you can produce it and then inject it into a patient. So that if you uh, plot that equation uh, using a computer program here, that is what we get. You see that once you put your manganese in a nuclear reactor, the radioactivity grows, 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 and exponential. It can continue growing exponentially forever. But uh, the time that you use a nuclear reactor uh, is time that you have to pay for. So after, say, 10 flights, you find that you take the 56 isotope and you inject it into the patient as it decays, uh, you can determine the volume uh, that uh, basically of the blood in a patient. The application of radioactivity is, uh, uh, are so numerous that uh, uh, you, we would spend uh, a whole course just having uh, uh, detailing uh, how these radioactive isotopes are used. So I built up here a table uh, to tell us some of the important isotopes in our life. One of them is one. It has a half-life of 432 years. You will be astonished to know that this is used in smoke detectors for homes and businesses. And uh, uh, it emits an alpha particle. Uh, as the alpha particle is being emitted, uh, uh, a circuit uh, is uh, in the, uh, in the uh, smoke detector uh, is not, uh, uh, is active. If smoke occurs, it uh, closes the circuit, it shorts it, and then you hear the alarm and uh, that has saved hundreds of thousands uh, of life in general. If you work in the oil industry, uh, americium-241 is used in the logging of oil wells to determine whether it is a hydrocarbon in a given formation or not. Uh, let me go over some of the more uh, prominent applications. You can read about the others themselves. Carbon-14 is a very important isotope too. Uh, uh, as cosmic radiation interacts with uh, the uh, Earth's uh, atmosphere, uh, it interacts, as we said, the, the air we breathe is primarily nitrogen, 70% nitrogen, 15% oxygen. Uh, from the, the cosmic radiation coming to us from the cosmos, interacts with nitrogen atmosphere and produces carbon-14. And this is happening com continuously. And then we are going, we are eating food that contains a carbon-14. So as we are living ourselves, other animals and uh, plants, uh, as the animal is, uh, uh, or the plant uh, is uh, alive, uh, it is incorporating. When we die, uh, we're not incorporating new radioactive carbon-14. Uh, so basically it starts decaying uh, over its half-life of 5,000 years. So in that case, it becomes the basis of archaeological dating. We can determine the age, say, of a charcoal, a tomb from uh, of the time of the Babylonian, to the time of the by uh, uh, estimating how much of that carbon-14 is not uh, being incorporated. Measure the activity 
at the initial time where the uh, isotope was available, uh, being produced and being incorporated in the plant or animal. And then when it decays, that's the basis of carbon dating. This is very important in biology in general and archaeology in general. And uh, if you work in pharmaceutical research, this is also important uh, in research, uh, ensuring that new drugs are metabolized without forming harmful byproducts in the human body. This is an important one with 30 years isotopes. Gamma radiation is used uh, basically in the treatment of cancers in but most importantly, it's used for the sterilization of uh, uh, medical products. The gamma radiation can kill different types on the surface of the one application is disposable syringes. Uh, when you got your, uh, uh, if you got the uh, uh, vaccine, uh, your syringe is uh, made out of plastic. It used to be made out of glass and, uh, and it was used uh, in the third world. In fact, they still boil it. Uh, boiling cannot viruses, so it has aid and hepatitis C. In the United States and, and country and in the lot, you find that those disposable syringes are sterilized using the radiation either from cesium-137, which is efficient, or from cobalt-60. Uh, so also its gamma rays and emissions are used in the sterilization of surgical instruments products. But it's also used, as we will see in the next chapter, uh, in the <clears throat> food preservation. And it will be used more so uh, some foods will spoil very quickly uh, by the growth of bacteria and fungi. And by irradiating them by cesium-137 and cobalt-60, you can kill uh, the bacteria. And uh, these are some uh, applications that I have picked up. Uh, I invite you to look at all of them. One of the very important ones is plutonium-238. Uh, plutonium-238 is the basis of uh, what NASA uh, provides uh, power for, for uh, exact, uh, in fact, the uh, probe that NASA is now running on Mars uh, does not use solar lights or photovoltaics. Right? Uh, photovoltaics get covered very quickly with dust the Mars, so a funk storm comes in and cleans up the dust of the photo cells, uh, and it happened actually. Uh, uh, but uh, the, also the nights on Mars are uh, very cold, so electronic equipment is used batteries to store the batteries. Uh, Plutonium-238 and uh, transform its heat into electricity, uh, as I'll show you in the, one of the next chapters, uh, or uh, you use it to heat the batteries and the electronic equipment uh, in space applications. We know, of course, plutonium-239, uh, that could be fuel for breeder fission reactors in our future, uh, or it can uh, basically be used also in nuclear devices in general. Radium-226 was mentioned. It is a daughter nuclide from the decay of uranium-238. Uh, it was the one discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie. That's why the Curie unit of uh, activity uh, is used to honor uh, Marie and Pierre Curie. It's used also to enhance the effectiveness of lightning uh, rods uh, in general. Uh, let us uh, look at uh, thorium-230. Thorium is uh, actually thorium-232 would be the more interesting one. Uh, thorium-232 occurs in nature uh, at four times the abundance of uranium-235. Uh, so in that case, you can have uh, four times the available fission energy supply, and that would be uranium-235. Here, the half-life of uranium-235 is in the billion, 10 to the ninth year. Uranium-238 has a half-life that is even longer, and that explains to us why is it that uh, uranium-238 today in nature is only 0.72 percent. Uh, uranium-238 is the most of the uranium isotopes. Uh, applications of uh, activity in modern uh, technology and in science it can be harmful, as we learn later on, uh, when uh, taken in large quantities that are beyond what 
the natural radiation environments provide us with, but uh, uh, every day each one of us has in the body the carbon fourteen that we just mentioned. Uh, uh, any plant or living creature uh, is incorporating carbon. Well, when we eat food like uh, carbohydrates, like that, that's sugar, and our brain functions on uh, glucose. Uh, without it, uh, we would not be right now. Uh, activity. activity occurs uh, all around us in our uh, structures, in our homes, in the food supply. So let's look, for instance, in the food supply. Uh, if you use milk, you drink milk, uh, you get uh, per liter of milk that you drink, 1400 pico curie. Pico is a unit that is 10 to the minus 12, a very small amount of uh, radio. Nevertheless, there is a radioactivity. In, uh, even if you use tap water, it is not 1400 picocuries. The more solids you have in a, in a liquid, the more the radioactivity that is in it. Tap water has picocuries per liter. Where does it come from? From the decay of the radioactive isotopes, uranium and thorium, uh, Earth crust, uh, water has been pumped from. Some materials, uh, some food supplies uh, uh, concentrate the radioactive substances, like Brazil nuts, uh, is known significant amount of picocuries per uh, gram. Uh, that's what, because the soil in Brazil contains large amounts of thorium and it concentrates it. And it's the cheapest uh, form of nuts that you can buy around Christmas. Uh, however, bananas uh, that we eat every day, oh, my breakfast today, was one banana. So in that case, you get So if you take 10 grams of uh, or, uh, or 100 grams, actually, you would be getting 300 pico curious uh, of uh, uh, activity. Uh, and that comes in that case for bananas. Our functioning of uh, the nerve system and the muscle system and all the organs in our human body and the presence of potassium. And not all 1% of potassium is the isotope of potassium, potassium 40. And uh, in that you found that already uh, you're getting some activity. Not harmful at all. It's part of the natural radiation environment. The peanut butter contains it too. Flour, if you eat bread, it would be uh, incorporating some radioactivity with limited amount that do not harm us uh, at all. I've looked at the radioactivity of tritium and uh, basically tritium turns into helium-3 by the emission of a negative electron. That's a single radioactive transformation. But in fact, uh, there are many, many other isotopes that uh, do not undergo one single decay. They can undergo many, many decays. So the waste is not just for three in where the first isotope decays, but then as it decays, uh, it, it's being formed by the previous isotope and so on. And then we can get this as N uh, uh, members of a chain of decay. Uh, some people went and the, uh, and uh, Mr. No, no, uh, uh, Bateman, Bateman, uh, Bateman uh, wrote the equations for some form in a moment before the end of the lecture. And uh, the Bateman's equation described really uh, a whole decay uh, process. Uh, the solution for it is called the Bateman's equation solution. Uh, it appears as the activity uh, for each isotope being the product of the decay constant. See here that symbol here uh, is the capital pi uh, is a symbol for products whereas uh, capital sigma is uh, the symbol for summation. So we are really uh, pro, uh, 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 multiplying the constant uh, here. Uh, uh, let me go from there of, uh, uh, and look at uh, some radioactive decay chains that I'm talking about. Uh, there are four of them that are quite uh, uh, substantial or famous, uh, we mentioned uranium-238. Uranium-238 uh, has been formed at the time of the 
uh, supernova that created the solid uh, or the rocky planet in our own decay chain. And it follows some recursive formula. That's why it's called the 4n plus 2 chain. Radon 222 that you mentioned earlier is part of that radioactive chain. There is also the thorium 232 chain. We said thorium occurs in nature, but it has a recursive formula for n. Uh, the uranium 238 chain, uh, it's called the actinium chain, and it has a recursive formula for n is for n plus three. And then humans, uh, these three chains occur in nature, but one fourth chain has been created by humans. It's called the neptunium 237 artificial chain. It has uh, a different uh, recursive formula. So let me uh, move forward and what am I talking about here? in terms of those decay chains. Let's take the one for uranium uh, 235. Uh, no, uh, let me. <clears throat> uh, this is the decay chain for uranium 238. And the decay chain shows us the atomic number of uranium 238 is obviously 92. And the mass number is 238. If you go to the chart of Nikolaid, you'll find that uranium 238 decays primarily by the emission of an alpha particle. So if you emit an alpha particle, your atomic number decreases by two, so it becomes 90. Oh, so the uranium-238 turns into thorium. And the alpha particle emitted reduces the 238 by four units from 238 to thorium-234. Now, this one has a, a half-life of 4.51 billion years, billion years. However, the thorium-234 is very short-lived as a radioactive isotope. It has a half-life only of 24 days. So within 24 days, <clears throat> it emits a negative electron. And when you emit a negative electron, like in the decay of tritium, you increase the atomic number from 90 to 91. And uh, the 91 uh, 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 element in the periodic is Also, uh, it can appear as protactinium-234 with 6.7 hour half-life, or it appears as that 234M. This is what we mentioned as a mode of radioactive decay and isomeric state. So that one is unstable. Within 1.18 minutes, it emits another and turns back from being protactinium-91 back into uranium 92, but it's not uranium 238 anymore. It has lost four units, four uh, uh, particles. So it becomes the origin of the existing uranium 234 that we find in nature. There is what's called the branching process in that uh, the isotope decay can follow this way or the isomeric state comes as, uh, goes down to the ground state. And this one itself decays into the emitting a beta particle, the protoactinium becomes uranium-234. Uranium-234 is a short half to the fifth year, uh, years than the U-238 that has a half-life of 10 to the ninth year. Hence, uh, that decay is faster than uranium-238. Uh, and uh, that's why its abundance in nature is very low. 238 itself emits an alpha particle. So if it emits an alpha particle, the atomic number decreases by two and the mass number, the total mass decreases by four. So it becomes now thorium 230. Uh, it has a half-life of 10 to the fourth year. Oh, it turns into our famous radium 226 that Pierre and Marie Curie were studying and its half-life is 1622 years. So when you calculate the activity uh, of one Curie of activity. You take one gram of radium-222, you use Avogadro's number in the assignment I'll give you today, uh, and calculate the number, initial number of atoms, and then multiply the n sub zero by the, decay, by the decay constant, which is a natural logarithm of 2.6931 divided into the half-life 1622. But you have to check the units here. The activity in Curies is per second. So you have to turn your years here, multiply into 365, turn it into days, multiply by 24 to make it hours, multiply it by 60 to make it minutes, multiply it by another 60 to make it seconds. Radium-226 uh, uh, is a solid. It's a metal, in fact, 
uh, decays through the emission of another of a number from 88 to 86 to 22, and radon gas in uh, 2022. Is uh, uh, a health hazard because it has a low boiling point. If you have any uh, uranium or thorium available in your construction material or in your basement, uh, that radon 222 is radioactive. You could see it emits an alpha particle, uh, and but it decays very rapidly uh, within 3.8 days half life into another uh, 218 decay to 214. Uh, there is a branching process for one to 18 go into S13 for the lead 214 goes to bismuth 214. Another branching, you can uh, bismuth 214 can go into polonium 214 or into thallium 210. And then uh, another branching, the lead 210 can be bismuth 210 and uh, 6 to thallium 206. Another branching, uh, you get to 10 and then eventually uh, passes into lead 206, which is stable. It's not radioactive anymore. So the fate of the existing uranium 238 in nature, if you start from here, eventually as the age of the universe and the universe increases, it is being turned into stable six. Now, uh, as uh, the uranium-238 occurs in many, many construction materials in our homes, in fact, if you walk in the fields, uh, uh, you'll find that uh, the earth itself, the ground contains uranium-238 and thorium-232, you'll find that uh, that uranium is emitting the gas, uh, radon-222. It doesn't exist for a long time as a gas, but uh, uh, in mining, you have to uh, of uranium in the mines of the uranium, you have to really to aerate the mine uh, and uh, ventilate it. Uh, otherwise, it gets into the lung of miners. Now, what happens with the miners? Your the isotopes occur: the polonium 210 and the lead 210. This one has a half-life of 10, 22 years. This one 138. Uh, if you notice in the equation for the activity, uh, the shorter uh, the, the half-life, higher the now to ten, to ten are solids. So nature, if you have uh, tobacco plant, you'll find that the radon is emitted from the soil. It's a gas. It turns into a solid that deposits itself on the leaves of the tobacco plant, and those who smoke cigarettes basically uh, generate smoke. Smoke is particulate matter. They deposit into their lungs that polonium 210 and lead 210, and both of them are beta emitters and alpha emitters. See, they go down this way or they go up uh, that way. And in that case, uh, when you smoke cigarettes and uh, the smoke itself, in addition of for being uh, uh, chemically toxic, it contains a benzoapyrene, which is a cancer causing element in cigarettes, you also are used to getting a radiological risk or hazard there by the deposition of polonium 210 and lead 210 emitting beta particles and alpha particles to the alveoli of the lung and destroying uh, the lungs. So that is, uh, you can tell that to any friend of yours who is smoking, show him the graph and uh, convince him that, well, uh, he should rethink the uh, smoking because it's not just chemically he mentioned 232 as being uh, more thrust than uranium by the breathing process. I might give you the equation to balance today as an assignment. Uh, you can turn it into uranium 233, which is an odd number isotope uh, in terms of the A, the mass number, and can provide us uh, because it's available four times. Uh, as much as uranium in the earth crust with an unlimited energy supply. Uh, you notice that it has a much longer half-life than uh, uranium-238, and that's why it is four times more abundant in the earth's crust than uranium-238. It decays through alpha emission to radium-228. Uh, that one emits a beta particle, actinium, to thorium-228, alpha particle, radium-224, and is a top of radium. Radon 220. In that case, and it's four times more abundant than uranium. So, in fact, 
uh, if you have uh, rocky formations like in the Appalachian Mountains and the Rocky Mountains, people build their homes on deposits of granite. And granite contains uranium as well as thorium. In fact, you go to a central station in New York, if you visit New York, go to lots of granite. In the con they use lots of granite in the construction and uh, Central Station is known for its high level of radon. And then if you go to uh, uh, the uh, uh, kind of uh, recommendations, uh, he warns us about radon in homes. You go to it and you get your degree, uh, go get a job, you buy a car, the next home. Uh, when you buy the home, uh, remember to check for the Radon 220. You go to a, the, the uh, hardware store, you buy a kit uh, that you place in the basement of the house that you want to buy, and uh, then uh, for a, a week maybe, then send it to a laboratory. And then you, you can remedy it by putting, say, a sheet of plastic in the basement or on the crawl space of your house or simply cancel the house where you are subject to the release of radon 220. Look here, it's a very short half-life. It doesn't stay there for long. But again, it turns into the uranium 210 and lead 212 and lead of uranium 238. Eventually, it turns into stable to uh, lead 208. So that very long half-life uh, thorium in nature eventually for of years, we cannot uh, stop by, uh, uh, without looking at the uranium-235 isotope. See, it's a shorter half-life than uh, uranium-238, and that's why its abundance is only 0.72% in uranium. Uh, it decays in a similar fashion. Uh, to uh, alpha to thorium-231, beta to protoactinium, alpha actinium, alpha francium, uh, alpha uh, statine, and then at the end, you get that branching. In that case, it's not polonium-210, like 238, but polonium-211, and both of these decay into lead again, lead-207, which is stable, and that breaks the chain. As I suggested, you find that each number, member of the chain follows the recursive formula for n plus three, where n the, is the number of alpha particles that are emitted in each transition. Humans have created a magic chain. If you look at the beginning of uh, uh, plutonium from, which is a reaction that happens in existing nuclear reactors, you'll find that an odd number isotope, neptunium-237 is formed. Uh, so this is not uh, in nature whatsoever. This is a, a chain that was created by humans. You'll find that uh, it has a much shorter half-life than uranium-235 or thorium-232. It turns into protoactinium-233. And, oh, lo and behold, it turns into the isotope uranium-233, which is a fissile isotope. It can be used to produce power, like uranium-235 or like uranium-235 uh, uranium or like your plutonium-239. It decays into thorium-229, and then we get the radium-235. It does not decay into the radon gas. Uh, so that radium-222 now turns into actinium-225, into francium-221, uh, and eventually, you'd think it goes to lead. No, it goes to lead-209. This one, three hours, turns into 209. So the three natural chains the totals of lead to six or seven to eight, but the uh, artificial chain decays into bismuth to O9. That's a human-made uh, chain. So in that case, I'll uh, give you as an assignment for today.